Thank you, Brother Sam and Praise Team for leading us in worship. In 1938, Nicholas Winton was a 29-year-old London stockbroker. And he was about to leave for a skiing holiday in Switzerland when he received a phone call from a friend of his, Martin Blank, uh, Blake, asking him to cancel his trip and immediately come to Prague. He says, I have a most interesting assignment for you and I need your help. He says, don't bother bringing your skis. When Winton arrived, he was asked to help in the camps, which, which thousands of refugees were living in appalling conditions. When he gets to Prague, this is at the start of the Blitzkrieg, and he gets a bird, such a burden for the refugee children that he ultimately oversaw the rescue of 669 children and brought them back to England. After the war, Nicholas Winton didn't tell anybody what he did. Not even his wife Greta about all his wartime rescue efforts. In 1988, a half a century later, his wife Greta finds a scrapbook in their attic with all the children's photos, with a complete list of names, a few letters from parents of the children, and many other documents. Literally in 2011, they made a movie entitled Nikki's Family and talked about how one act of kindness by one man helped change the world. They literally referred to the children as Winton's children because he literally rescued so many children uh, and, and brought them out of those refugee camps. The amazing thing is Nicholas just died in 2015 at the age of 106. Now there's another man that I want to introduce to you. He sits at a luxurious resort in Jamaica. He's counting his millions of dollars as he writes one fiction novel after another fiction novel, and he turns in, and each one turns into a best-selling movie. And all at the same time, he has an adulterous affair, which culminates in a marriage and a son who later commits suicide. This man is Ian Fleming. He's the author of the James Bond saga books, which turned into many movies. He died in his mid-50s due to a heart attack after years of drinking and becoming an alcoholic. See, man, one man was enslaved by an overruling love to set his fellow man free when he was free to rise to true greatness. Again, Winton was a very wealthy man young stockbroker who was fixing to be one of the great leaders in the banking industry at England decided, hey, I'm going to go help save these children. While this other man had worldly possibilities, but his life ends premature. See, every person on planet Earth seeks freedom. Abraham Lincoln said, freedom is the last best hope of the Earth. So today I want to start a series entitled, One Another Summer. A one another summer. And today we want to talk about a one another calling. You say, why? There are 93 one another passages in the New Testament, and 50 of them are biblical commands for you and I. And so we're going to look at this series. We're actually going to take this series right up to revival, which will start the last Sunday in August. So start praying for revival uh, Brother Bard will be here that last Sunday. So we're ramping up to revival with what we want to look at, a one another calling. And today we want to look at just one of those commands in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. It says, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another. Through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. See, Paul is talking to the Galatian churches about how real freedom is not found in legalism and it was not found in a license to sin. But real freedom is this today. This is what we want to talk about. It's expressed through loving service. Loving 
service. Do you have real freedom today? Have you experienced freedom in Jesus Christ? Today I want to give you, talk to you about three callings as we kick off this one another summer. Number one, you are called to freedom. It says you're called to be free. This is the theme that, that Paul talks about in this letter. And he actually, this ties back in verse 1 of chapter 5. If you look there in your Bible, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit to a yoke of slavery. Now why is Paul talking about freedom here to these Galatian Christ followers? Because they had been rescued from, they had been saved and delivered from slavery to sin. The reason he's talking about it, if you're with us on Wednesday nights, if you don't have anything to do on Wednesday nights, we go going through the book of Galatians right now, and literally what Paul is talking about is there had then been these guys that had slipped into the church called the Judaizers, and basically what they were saying is it's okay to believe in Jesus, but you've got to uphold the law and legalism and be circumcised. So what they were saying is Jesus plus this equals salvation. Whereas Scripture says faith alone in Christ equals salvation. See, what these Judaizers thought, man, if, if I just keep all these rules that I could... Make God happy and, and make it to heaven. Legalism is like this. If I'm good today, God loves me a little bit more. If I keep these rules, you know, I go to church, I don't say any bad words, and I don't do all this stuff, then, I, then I'm okay, you know, and um, God loves me a little bit more. But if I stumble and fail, then God doesn't love me quite as much. See, legalism is polar opposite of the grace of God. So let me give you two truths that I see here in verse 13. Number one, you become free when you're saved. You become free when you're saved. He says you're called to be free. Now this word called here is talking about, hey, the one, when you came to a place in your life and you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Now the, the verb here is in the passive voice, which means you, you didn't call Jesus, he called you. Okay, you, you can't call down Christ into your life. He's the one that initiates it, okay? And so you got, what he's saying is because of the gospel, you believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You believed in that resurrection, and because of that, you repented of your sins, you made that turn, and you received him by faith because you called on the name of the Lord. You believe Jesus is Lord. And Jesus says, hey, now follow me. He says, follow me because you're free in Christ. But that freedom comes from Christ. It didn't come from anything that you earned. So you can't know true freedom. You can't know real freedom till you become a Christ follower. Verse 13 says, he says, you are called to be free. You want to know what our life is before we come to be free? I don't have time to go there. Just read verses 19 through 21. It says, for the works of the flesh are. That's our life before Christ. But man, once we come to know Christ, let me give you two verses. John 8, 32 and John 8, 36 says, you will know the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus and the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, you're what? You really will be free. Man, once you come to know Jesus, you are free in Him. Man, that's a great truth. See, when we come to know Him, hey, we've been accepted and redeemed by our Savior. Now, back then in their culture, if a master loved his slave, then he could let that slave go by hand and set it free. Actually, in the Greek world, what they would do is they would go in the temple, pay, offer up and pay a price for an offering, and then give the slave a certificate of freedom. See, once we come to repent of our sins and put our faith in Christ, we are free. We're no longer enslaved to sin. Now, above a concentration camp in Auschwitz, Germany, there was three German words, which I'm not going to pronounce to you, but let me tell you what they mean in English. It said, work makes free. Work makes free. All those prisoners of camp saw that, said, work makes free. 
That's a bold-faced lie. And it was to those prisoners, right? They weren't going to get free if they worked. Their promised freedom was what? A horrifying death. If you haven't read about the concentration camps, you need to go read about them. They weren't pretty. That's a bold-faced lie. And when you believe your good works and being a good Baptist and a good church member are going to get you to heaven, you bought in a bold-faced lie from the father of all lies, which is Satan. See, you're not free indeed because you think you can believe a little Jesus. We've got a lot of people in our churches believe a little Jesus and believe in a little works, and then I'll get to heaven. That's a bold-faced lie, and if you're believing that today, you have bought into the father of all lies, Satan. Because, man, once you come to know Jesus, you are set free by the blood of Jesus, which we just sang about. Man, we died to give us freedom from the what? The penalty of sin. Man, we died to free us from the guilt of sin. Before we come to know Christ, the reason we come to know is because we're guilty. We're sinners. Man, we're freed from the guilt of sin. We're freed from the shame of sin. Praise God, we're free from the power of sin. Man, you're free. In Christ. Second, let me give you this truth here. You're given a warning. Now, who's he talking here in the text? He says, brothers and sisters. I'm not talking to people out there in the law that are lost and don't know Jesus yet, haven't come to experience the freedom of Christ. He's talking to those who've given their lives to Christ. He says, what in the text? Don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Now, you need to understand what the word opportunity means here. It was a military word that was referred to a base camp for military operations. What he's saying is don't use your freedom as a base camp of operations for the flesh. See, that's, what the, that's the way the world thinks. It is. I used to be Bruce. Now I want to be Caitlin. I can do whatever I want to with, with my body. See, Jesus Christ didn't come into the world so that you could abuse the freedom and the grace of God and to take His blood lightly. See, in the 60s, some of you lived in that and you came through the sexual revolution and everybody thought free love and free peace and do whatever you want was the answer, right? All you need, as the Beatles used to sing, is love but it still did not satisfy people's desires. People thought, well, I'll drink and do drugs and smoke marijuana because I'm free. But what happened? They became enslaved and addicted instead of being free. You need to understand the arch enemy, arch enemy of freedom is sin because the devil wants you to be enslaved to sin. On your outline, real freedom is this. It's not doing what you want, but what you ought. Real freedom, I don't know if that's your own outline, but you need that. Real freedom is not doing what you want, but what you ought. Paul explains to us that freedom is not a license to ignore God's desire for our holiness. See, biblical freedom is never freedom to sin. Let me explain it like this. There's this train. It goes down the tracks from point A to point B, delivering stuff every day. Every day it goes up and down the same tracks, delivering stuff, and the train gets tired. I get tired of going up and down the same tracks. So the train decides, I want to chart my own open course and do what I want to for a change. So what happened to the train? Train decided to get off the tracks, thought he'd go a different way. What happened? Train gets off tracks, what's going to happen? Derailed. De derailed and crash. See, a train was made to go on what? The tracks. You and I were called to walk with Jesus Christ every day. See, there's an old saying, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. 
as our students were challenged this week, there is convergence. And there's two paths to choose. We all have two paths. You can choose the way of Christ or you can choose the way of the world. See, many times Christians become enslaved because they want to emphasize their freedom. See, some Christians think, you know, I can watch whatever movies I want. I can watch a lot of R-rated movies. And what happens is before long, as we talked about last week, they become enslaved and then they start watching pornography. They thought, oh, I've got this freedom. Yeah, you have freedom. But if you don't watch it, you'll become enslaved. See, many Christians think, oh, you know, I can handle drinking some alcohol because I am free in Christ only suddenly to find themselves drunk and an alcoholic. So you might sound the siren of freedom, but if you're not careful, it'll become a platform and a base camp of operations for the flesh. See, real freedom is governed by the love of Christ. It does not give us a license to be dominated by lust. See, you got two tracks. You can choose the tracks of joy and grace through faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you can choose the other tracks which come from the triple threat enemy, the flesh, the devil, and the world. See, first, we're called to freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ through salvation. Number two, you're called to serve. Now, it's kind of a paradox here. He says, you're free, but then he says what? Now, serve. Be my slave. Henry Blackaby said this, the world will estimate your importance by the number of people serving you. But God is more concerned with the number of people you are serving. Now let me give you two truths here. Number one, serve one another. Now the word serve here means to render service to or this, to do that which is for the advantage of someone else. This word here, service, is a present Tense, it's an active imperative, which means it's something that we're to do daily. We're to serve one another daily. It's something that you and I must do. See, Christian freedom challenges us to love one another, to serve one another. Theodore Ferris is a pastor in Boston. He went, on, he went to Africa on a mission trip and he visited this leprosy hospital. Now, leprosy is an awful disease. Now, most places it's been eradicated due to advances in medicine, but in a lot of places, if they don't have a lot of medicine, people still get leprosy today. And it is an awful disease. And this one young nurse, the pastor was watching, he was minister, she was taking care of probably the worst man there. And this nurse was a U.S. missionary, and she was taking care of him, and the pastor said the stench, the smell was awful. And the sores all over his body were just terrible. He said, pastor said, I could barely look at him without getting sick to my stomach. That's how bad this man looked. And he told the nurse, he says, I would not do what you're doing for a million dollars. You know what the nurse said? Neither would I. She says, I'm serving out of my love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not doing this because I'm getting paid. I'm doing this because God has saved me and I want to serve others. See, we're called to serve one another. But second, we're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. We're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. Jesus says, talks about Jesus in Mark 10, 45. says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What are you saying, Pastor? This is what I'm saying. Find your place of service here at Bethsaida. There's all kinds of places for you to serve. You got next generation ministry. You say, what's that? Let me just tell you what that is. Uh, preschoolers, children, and students. So why do we need to minister to them? Because if we don't minister to them, there won't be a church down the road. That's why. That's why we need to minister to them. 
You say, I've done my time. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I'm just going to straight up tell you like it is. If you can take care of your grandkids, you can come and minister to the Lord's kids here. Smoke that in your pipe for a minute. See, we need your help in that area. We've got some really dedicated people. But if we don't have some more people step up, they're going to burn out. You say, what are you saying, Pat? This is all I'm saying. You need to hear my heart here. This is not difficult. This is not rocket science here, okay? All we're saying, man, if you just served six times this year, man, you would be an awesome, awesome help. Just six. And if you can't do six, just give me four. There's on every fifth Sunday, that's only four times a year. That's not, I'm not asking every week, just six to four times, folks. See, he's called us to serve one another. Man, if you're concerned about your grandchildren, your children, you ought to be concerned about other children because the only hope they have is Jesus and they ain't going to get it out in the world, so you better love on them fast because they're going to grow up fast. That's all we're asking. Say, well, where else can I serve? Man, there's all kinds of ways. Choir, media, technology, pro presenter. There's all kinds of places. Pastors, prayer partners, I need some more of y'all to decide, hey, I'll, I'll pray for you. Say, well, pastor, I'm not, I, I'm not good at praying in front of people. I'm not even asking you to pray in front of people. I'm just asking you to, again, four to six times. You go on vacation more than that. That's all I'm saying. Four to six times say, man, I love my Lord so much, I'd be willing to stand in the gap and pray for about 15 to 20 minutes that God would move in a service and that we might see Him stir instead of playing church. You say, you're wound up. Yeah, I've been doing church for six days. This is my seventh day, and I'm pumped up. And if you don't like it, hit the door, Jack. Because just four to six times, Again, I'm not asking, give me 52 weeks. Jesus ought to be telling you that, but just four to six times. You say, I'm not really great. Do you know the Lord? Yeah, then you can pray. Simple. It's not hard. I mean... There's all kinds of places. We're just going to be late for Sunday school, so you just might as well camp it in. If you need to go to Sunday school, just go. Because um, this ain't happening. I need people to work in life groups in Sunday school. Say, hey, I'd be willing to be a care leader in my, my class. I'd be willing to be a prayer leader in my class. Hey, I'd be the willing one. Hey, let's have some fellowship. Get everybody together. I need people to be willing to say, hey, I got some time. I'm retired. I can go visit some people in, in the nursing home and shut-ins and elderly. There's all kinds of places for you to serve here. We're not asking you to serve in every ministry. Hear my heart. No. I don't want you to burn out. I want you growing. I mean, you can be involved in discipleship. You can be involved in missions here locally. Eventually we're going to go in other parts of this country and ultimately in around the world. There's places you can serve. You hear my heart. Why? Because we want to rep reproduce disciples in this generation and in the next generation and in the next generation if Jesus don't come back. Why? Because He's called us to be servants. He's called us to be servants. He's called us to be his slaves. In the United States, we had slavery years ago, and it was abused in the past. Many treated slaves wrong. You need to understand, slavery is huge today. 
If you don't understand, human trafficking is huge, even in our country today. With women and children, it's awful in other nations. Let me read to you a passage out of Exodus 21. Because Scripture had parameters. Say there was slavery in the Bible. Yeah, there was slavery in the Bible, but they had parameters. Every seven years, they released their slaves. And in their year of Jubilee, which was every 50 years, they released the slaves. Look at this passage. It says, but if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I do not want to leave as a free man. His master is to bring him to the judges and then bring him to the door of the doorpost. They get in the door jam, and his master will pierce his ear. He literally put his ear. This is a little painful, a lot, uh, lot worse than getting your ears pierced, ladies. And he will pierce his ear with an awl, sharp tool, and then what? He will serve his master for life. See, real freedom is expressed through a surrendered and willing servant. See, Paul's saying, hey man, you used to be slaves to sin, now you're slaves to Christ, you're to serve Him. He died and shed His blood for you. See, God wants the best for us. But see, we're to serve our Master, our Lord, it's a, I really believe, for life. And if you don't understand and you don't believe it, you haven't read the text, you need to understand once we get to heaven, that's what we're going to be doing too. Worshiping and serving the Lord for all eternity. Number three. You're called to love. You're called to love. Those who are free from the law, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a life of love. Love asks, how can I serve others? Love asks, how can I edify others? Love asks, how can I do this in accordance to the gospel? See, love is the reason and the manner that we serve others. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul said in Galatians 2, 20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who what? Who loved me and gave Himself up for me. Because Christ loved us, we ought to love others. So let me give you these two truths here. When you act with love toward others, you need to understand you have fulfilled the law of God. Look at this text real quick. It says, hey, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Matthew, Jesus said, I'll break down the commandments, 613 of them that y'all built up, Jews, into two. Love God, basically all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Now what's interesting, don't miss this. Now who's Paul dealing with? He's dealing with these Judaizers who are pushing the law on these new Christians. And what does he quote right here? If you don't know where this text comes from, uh, love your neighbor as yourself is not New Testament. It's Leviticus 19.18. And so what's amazing is he quotes to them the law and says, Here, here's how it's fulfilled when you love your neighbor as yourself. Now who's your neighbor? Remember the Good Samaritan story? Helps out a man he didn't even know. See, we should be known for loving our neighbors. See, we think our neighbors, and the Jews thought their neighbors were those that just looked like them and lived close to them. Your neighbor is actually your spouse. Actually, neighbor means closest to you at that time. Your neighbors could be the ones living across the street, but also your neighbor is the one that you're standing next to in the line at Kroger. That's your neighbor. Now let me apply it in a marriage sense here very quickly. Husbands, if you're free in Christ... Ask yourself this question. How can I love and serve my wife and make her stronger in the Lord? And then wives, in what ways can I love, support, and affirm and respect my husband so that he's strengthened spiritually? 
See, when you start serving and loving your spouse, I promise you your marriage relationship is going to get a whole lot stronger. Now, one of the beautiful pictures is, is when you see a couple that's been married, and we have some of our church been married 65, 70 plus years, and sometimes you see a couple and one spouse takes care of their other spouse for a year or two or three, and they're just serving them because that other spouse is sick and they can't take care of themselves. And they take care of that spouse and they serve that spouse, but they serve them what? Out of love. And they serve their spouse till they go on to be with the Lord. So that's a beautiful picture. We're to love one another through our service. But then last, let me give you this last point. I can't even speak on it. But God's love and bitter strife cannot coexist. <laughs> this is another warning, he says. He, he says, hey, if you, you, you bite one another and you literally uh, devour one another, watch out, you'll be consumed by one another. He says, you can't be in fight with one another. Now, maybe he's referring to a picture of the animals that they would use in the Roman circus and let them go out, or maybe the slaves would, would fight amongst one another, or maybe he was talking, uh, uh, referring to a bunch of middle school girls that they don't watch, and they get all wrapped up in drama, and they can consume one another. See, we're to love one another. Because, see, real freedom leads to a love that makes all the difference. Real freedom leads to a love that makes all the difference. Man, man, when He has changed our lives and we show that love, it makes all the difference in the world. When you love others, you serve others, and people see it and you say, they say, why did you do that? Because Christ changed my life. There's a man by Jim, and he met his friend Alex at the car dealership where his friend Alex worked. And Jim had been inviting Alex to church, and he had come some. But Alex said, he said, Jim, he says, I feel like a hypocrite every time I come to church. He says, because I fail to live for Christ so often. And so Alex asked, Jim asked his friend, Alex says, hey, what do you call this part of the dealership where we're just meeting here? And he says, this is the showroom. He says, what's behind the showroom and past the parts counter? Alex says, well, that's the service department. Jim says, well, what if I told you I didn't want to bring my car to the service department because it was running bad, but I wanted to bring it to the showroom to get fixed? God says, that'd be crazy. That's the whole point of the service department, to fix cars that are not running right. Jim says, yeah, you're absolutely right. He says, let's think about church. Church is not a showroom where image is everything. But start thinking of church as God's service department. Where we help and we all work together and we serve together and we help keep people running in order with God. See, that's what the church is all about. See, real freedom is expressed through loving service where we serve one another and we love one another. Praise the Lord that Jesus Christ, He gave up His privilege. He gave us the ultimate example of a servant. You say, why? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. He was the ultimate servant for us. So what are you saying? I think we ought to have a one another summer. summer. I think we ought to have a one another day every week too. But for these next several weeks, we're going to focus on this. So remember, you are called to freedom. Praise the Lord, we live in a free nation. But even if we didn't live in a free nation, we're called to freedom in Christ. But because of that, you're called to serve and you're called to love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you and we do praise you.